name is Julie Politsis, and I'll be talking to you today about spinal cord and peripheral nerve stimulation. Many thanks to the CNS for this opportunity to share our experience. As you all know, chronic pain is a significant contributor to the increased opioid usage in the United States. 100 million Americans suffer from chronic pain, and many suffer from opioid abuse. And oftentimes, this is directly resultant to receiving opioids for a procedure in an inappropriate quantity or um, duration. Oftentimes when we think about pain medication, all we think about is opioids. And um, these, in fact, aren't our only options. There's a variety of um, different options. Some increase bleeding risk, so we're less prone to use them in the post-operative patient. Others, um, such as gabapentin or pregabalin, take a four to six weeks to dose optimize. So again, not um, helpful in the inpatient setting when you're looking to reduce length of stay and get patients home. So I just added on this slide um, to make sure that people are aware of other options. Deloxetine and chipiramate are two medications where uh, patients can have relief in a couple of days that may allow for faster and um, uh, faster discharges with more pain relief. So spinal cord stimulators certainly aren't uh, new technology, though I will tell you in the period of time that I've been involved in placing these, they have gone um, through many iterations. And I always um, joke that this is not your uh, grandmother or grandfather's spinal cord stimulation. There is many more electrodes, configurations, and programming options. Here on the right, uh, I show a, a paddle lead, and now if you're placing spinal cord stimulators, it's probably best to know how to place percutaneous leads shown on the left here as well as they're less invasive. Your patients look great at two weeks and this may be a way to um, treat especially older adults with a less invasive surgery. It used to be that in order for a spinal cord stimulator to be beneficial, you had to have leg pain. Now these can be used for back pain. Very exciting. Um, there's been recent work showing efficacy in painful diabetic neuropathy as well. One advantage that SES has over other procedures, and this holds true for peripheral nerve stimulation too, is that you can try it before you buy it. So uh, oftentimes when you're having a spine surgery, you're not sure how you're going to feel afterwards. With a spinal cord stimulator, you can have a pretty good uh, guess based on what your trial period is like. Um, usually this is four to seven days, and what I tell my patients is at the end of this, this needs to be a black or white decision. You either want it or you don't want it. Um, not maybe it'll work or maybe the permanent implant will do better or I have nothing else to lose. You have to be compelled to have this done and that's your opportunity. We place it and then we have uh, reprogrammings in order to help patients to make that black or white decision. Um, the best patients that I see are those that have 80% or greater pain relief and are almost crying on the day that their trial has to be removed before they're permanent. Um, that's not to say that if uh, patients have 50% relief, they're not good candidates, but this is a really important um, aspect of the preoperative workup that needs to be talked about. Also important in the preoperative workup is a preoperative MRI. I explained to patients that you wouldn't operate on any other part of the body um, without getting an MRI. So um, you, you, we need one for this, uh, as well as a preoperative uh, pain psychology evaluation. While this is something that insurance companies often require, I really think it's a good idea because living with chronic pain destroys your life. And what the pain psychology evaluation talks about is whether patients have the coping skills to get better. It's, I tell patients, it's somewhat arrogant of me to think that I could fix a problem they've been dealing with for 10 years with a simple device placement when there's so many aspects of the tri-dimensional pain experience. So the pain psychologist can help me look into those. 
Now, no procedure is without risk, uh, though there are ways to minimize this. S serious neurologic complications have been reported up to 2%. Um, most oftentimes, uh, this can be avoided with careful pre, post, and perioperative management. Um, there is some risk of epidural or hematoma. Um, and spinal fluid leak um, is not uncommon, and um, I would are you probably underreported in this series? So how can we mitigate risk? Well, it's important to have a sense of checks and balances. So um, formerly, all spinal cord stimulators were implanted awake. Now, a vast majority of them are implanted asleep, though you can do this awake, but you need some means of response. So intraoperative monitoring has become increasingly important, especially for paddle placement, where you can tell that the integrity of the spinal cord is being maintained, and you can assess laterality of the spinal spinal cord as well. Um, this is sometimes done for percutaneous procedures as well. It takes out the variability of waking a patient up from propofol who um, may be uh, difficult when they are awoken or may have less reliable responses. Because this is a procedure in the epidural space, uh, I am um, similarly um, conservative about what how to manage anticoagulants perioperatively. Um, I make sure that I am in touch with uh, the cardiologist or whoever the prescribing doctor is, especially with new, uh, many of the new anticoagulants that are available. Um, our colleagues in anesthesia, uh, both through NAC, uh, Neurostimulation Appropriateness Consensus Committee, as well as ASRA, have come up with uh, recommendations for percutaneous leads. Uh, lead obviously is more invasive and you know you should have the same protocols that you would for any of your other spine cases. Uh, honestly I maintain the same protocol for my percutaneous leads as well as my paddle leads in regards to anticoagulants. Now I alluded to the fact that intraoperative monitoring could be um, useful not only for spinal cord integrity, but also to look at physiologic midline. Here's a MRI that is not at all uncommon, and we know that it's important to take in my uh, keep in mind what happens with the spinal cord when people have degenerative scoliosis. Often it's not in the location where you think about. Um, midline may not be um, in in the middle of the intraparticular uh, distance and monitoring can help you make sure that the paddle or the percutaneous leads you place for that patient are in the exact right spot. Um, you do have to keep in mind what previous surgeries the patient has had. Uh, this is especially important uh, in the cases of uh, percutaneous leads. For paddle leads, you're always going to look at you know where the interspace is that you're approaching. Um, since less surgery is done in the thoracic spine than in the lumbar spine, this is less of a problem. But if you're gonna enter for a percutaneous lead at L1, L2, L2, L3, it's important to make sure that your entry point for your needle hasn't been, uh, isn't going to be affected by previous surgery in that location. Uh, so what is the appropriate location and how do we identify this? Um, this was an example taken from a, a cervical lead placement um, where we place percutaneous leads, often going in the um, high thoracic area with entry point T4, T5 because of the amount of CSF there. We're always aiming from the medial portion uh, of the pedicle uh, a level or two below our, where our entry point wants to be. With this angle shown on the needle here, uh, towards the uh, spine, interspinous ligament, and with that approach, and with the lead, especially in the lumbar area of about 30 degrees off the patient's body, this can be a very an ideal trajectory. When you are higher up in the thoracic spine um, for a cervical lead, oftentimes you have to keep in mind um, the road where the needle is relative to the patient's anatomy, and it may be a steeper incline. I wouldn't recommend starting with cervical percutaneous leads. Make sure to get your land legs uh, on the lumbar percutaneous leads for um, back and leg pain first. 
Now there's a variety of ways to get access. Uh, most commonly, loss of resistance is used. And when you're comfortable with this, this is probably uh, an ideal thing to do. Our anesthesia colleagues um, swear by this and it, it really is a, a great thing to do. If you um, uh, need another option, hanging drop, uh, where you fill the needle with um, preservative free water. Um, I don't use saline because it can be disruptive to the intraoperative monitoring um, and watch the, the drop go away as you get into the epidural space. That is another alternative. The advantage of this is that it frees you up to use both hands as you advance the needle. The disadvantage is that you can have a higher rate um, of, of false negatives and um, potentially an increased risk of CSF. Uh, while we're doing percutaneous lead, it's also important to realize that you're gonna need a lot of AP and lateral fluoroscopy. Um, Oftentimes, you could go um, ventral uh, to the thecal sac, or you can be in the, the gutter. Um, and so really making sure that your lead is going in the right trajectory is essential. Obviously, for a paddle lead where you can see everything, you don't need a lateral x-ray, except in um, strange cases uh, where one may be required. I want to pivot a bit to talk about peripheral nerve stimulation. Um, this can be a very valuable technique. Uh, one of the greatest things we suffer with is getting approval to perform these procedures. I draw your attention to our guidelines that we have published that can be beneficial in um, submitting insurance claims. Um, there is data on uh, peripheral nerve stimulation, uh, though it remains um, relatively low level compared to some of the data on spinal cord stimulation. Um, a bit of a chicken and an egg phenomenon. You can't collect data when there isn't um, insurance approval for this. We published one of the largest series a couple of years ago and showed that we had a clear group of responders and non-responders when we were looking at peripheral nerve stimulation for a craniofacial pain. 60% um, responders. Um, we also noticed improvement across a battery of tests uh, in, in this group of patients, NRS as well as Beck depression inventory and pain catastrophization scale. Now, the most common of these techniques is the occipital nerve stimulator, which is used for occipital neuralgia. Um, this shows a uh, placement of percutaneous leads for occipital neuralgia. A couple of key things to be aware of here. One, um, I use this flexible needle that allows me to bend with the trajectory. Uh, you should be performing this right um, adjacent to the level of uh, the, den, the tip of the dens, and that's how I know I'm in the right spot. My needle passage is right at the level of the fascia. Uh, if you go too close to the skin, um, patients can get a, um, a prickly sensation. And if you go too deep, you're going to miss uh, the nerves. Also, make sure that you are anchoring these leads right as they come out of the fascia. I also then create um, a loop and uh, use three-point fixation in order to anchor these down. Anchoring is absolutely essential for these cases cases, as well as percutaneous lead placement. The anchoring is what prevents migration, and please make sure, especially in percutaneous spinal cord stimulators, uh, to pay a lot of attention to that. There are also some practical concerns. So when you place an occipital nerve stimulator, you have to think about where you're gonna place the battery. If you're gonna place the battery in the chest, you have to be careful about how you position the patient in the lateral sense, making sure that the needle doesn't poke out when it's furthest distance. I've started to place most of my batteries in the flank for that region. Of course, when you're going a greater distance where you have multiple parts of bending, you're at an increased risk of migration. So I make sure even if I could get the lead from incision A to incision C, that I have a stop point and create an incision B here to place a strain relief loop uh, in order to prevent migration. This has helped a lot with my um, prevention of migration in this complication.
I want to touch briefly on alternative waveforms. Um, over the last years, uh, high frequency stimulation and burst stimulation have become increasingly important. And why these are important is uh, one, there is uh, data showing better pain relief. And two, this has kind of thrown the gate theory of pain on its head. Specifically, we always thought you had to feel a tingling and vibration sense in order for a device to be working. And with these um, different forms of uh, waveforms, uh, in fact, you don't, and you can get pain relief. Um, we're still exploring one, uh, some of the many reasons why this could be. So in summary, spinal cord stimulation and peripheral nerve stimulation uh, can be effective therapies in patients that have failed uh, other options. Spinal cord stimulation can be implanted percutaneously with equal results. It can be used for back pain in the absence of leg pain and recently has been shown to be effective for uh, peripheral diabetic neuropathy as well as neck and radicular pain. Uh, it is an exciting time to be involved in neuromodulation. Please feel free to contact me at any time with any questions. Uh, I've implanted a lot of these and would love to be a resource for any questions you may have. As with everything, it takes a team. Many thanks to my team as well as uh, our funding sources.